Well, praise the Lord. How about that? I hope that you had a great break there for just a few minutes. I know that you enjoyed that first hour of Nightline, and it is my strong, strong conviction and uh, just a really, really good hunch, for lack of better words, that this second hour is not going to be any less of a blessing than that first hour was. We, of course, are looking at the Scripture this evening from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 through 14, where the Word of God says, And they brought young children to Jesus, that He should touch them. And His disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, He was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer or allow the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. I rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even though Christ physically has ascended to the Father's right hand, His Spirit is still actively involved doing the ministry through the body of Christ here on planet earth. And we're greatly honored this evening to have here on Nightline in just a moment, Pastor Benjamin Musuhaki. And he is with the Reach the Children of Rwanda International. He's coming from Rwanda, Central Africa. And uh, his story is so unique that you will not want to miss it. A lot of his story, we have heard the background on the news over the years from all over uh, the nations of the world. But you've never heard on the nightly news about what happened to Pastor Benjamin. But you're going to hear tonight here on Nightline for the very first time ever here at WGGS TV 16. We are also looking forward to having the envoys to sing, and they're going to be sharing the gospel in music. It's my conviction as well that you're going to be very, very blessed tonight. I pray that you'll be impressed. I don't want you to be stressed, but I'm believing by the grace of God that you are going to be blessed. In fact, the envoys are going to sing a song right now, simply entitled, Be Blessed. Be blessed, be a blessing, fathers will obey. Proclaim the name of Jesus to those who would be saved. His power is real today. Don't settle for anything less. Be blessed. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. A chosen generation who will walk in one accord. People who are not ashamed of the gospel in His word. A witness of this blessing. Who will share it with his word? Be blessed, be a blessing. The fathers will obey. Proclaim the name of Jesus to those who would be saved. Be bold, faith confessing. His power is real today. Don't settle for anything less. Be blessed. world let's be alive oh we can't hide these blessings we, we must share the love of christ in the boldness of his spirit souls of men we must pursue and claim them for his kingdom let these blessings flow through you and you and you yeah. be blessed be a blessing the fathers will obey Proclaim the name of Jesus to those who would be saved. Be bold, 
the faith confessing His power is real today. Don't settle for anything less. Be blessed. Be joyful. Be blessed. Be faithful. Be blessed. Be blessed. You can be delivered. Be All the blessings will receive. If only will be. Well, praise the Lord and thank you, Envoys, for that marvelous message in music. Be blessed. And I can already testify to the fact that there are those who are being blessed. We have many who have already called in uh, prayer requests as well as praise reports. And I want to encourage you to just simply keep on doing that. We have phone counselors. We have prayer partners who are ready, willing, and able to encourage you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We here at TV16 have never pretended that we have all the answers, but we profess with boldness that we do know the answer, and His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what an honor it is for me to be able to sit here this evening and introduce to our viewing audience for the very first time, I suppose, in, in the Greenville area, Pastor Benjamin Musu Hookie. And I will probably call you three or four different things, three or four different times, but I'm doing the best I can with your name. Pastor, it's an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Thank we you. appreciate you being here. How's everything going since you, since you got to the States? Well, I've been in the States for how many days now? Three or four days. And I'm um, adjusting my time, the time zone. In Rwanda, it's uh, night already. We are six to seven hours ahead. So, um, but last night I was able to sleep well. So I'm settling in very well. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, yeah. just do, do your best <laughs> to stay awake okay. while I'm talking to you, okay? And uh, we'll, yeah. we'll uh, learn more about the ministry mm -hmm of children of Rwanda International. I really yes. want to hear about that yes. and hear what God's doing mm -hmm. through that tremendous ministry. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, mm -hmm. I would uh, sincerely appreciate you just sharing with us mm -hmm. how God called you to serve Him among the children of Rwanda, knowing that usually when God does something, mm -hmm. uh, it's a process and the process begins sometimes many, many years yes. before the actual manifestation mm -hmm. of the call. Where did your story start? Well, the story of start, uh, started quite many, many years ago. But um, as I said, Benjamin Musuchi is my name. Uh, raised, grew up in Rwanda. And uh, many of you have heard about uh, Rwanda and what they know about Rwanda is uh, not the good things actually. Many right. have watched the movies Hotel Rwanda, sometimes in Apple. Uh, I've read the books Left to Tell. And uh, we are all products of that. Uh, we are there, we experienced it, and the hand of God was on us. And today, um, I'm glad to share with you how God really used some of my experiences then. Sure to planting the seed of wanting to serve God in that uh, particular way. That is really, I must say, not very great. Uh, if you look at the, the way society is structured these days, who would want to spend his or her life uh, lying in the mud and mingling with the dirty and the sick children? But God 
called me to doing that actually um, just after the uh, after the genocide and um, um, by the use of missionaries mm -hmm. who came and rescued us and uh, took us into the treatment centers. I'll never forget when uh, one of the missionaries, this was towards the end of the genocide, uh, came and lifted me up. He uh, kissed me on the cheek. And this is a child who is next to death. How you know? old were you then? At the time I was 14 years. Uh, and th think about lifting a 14 year old child. I had become so frail. I'd lost my ability to walk or even talk. But these men of God came, and uh, he, I vividly remember him kissing me on the cheek, mm -hmm. and he said, the love of Christ. Now, this was a white man, and I'm a black man, he, not even looking at my filthiness, you know, and he uses his clean lips to kiss my cheek. And that was all he said? That's all he said. The love of Christ. The love of Christ. And uh, this was in a train in, in a rehabilitation center where they had put us. And um, I strongly believe that maybe that was a, a seed that he planted, a seed that I would replicate later after my great education here at Erskine because I got mm -hmm. two master's degrees here. Mm -hmm. And the Lord could not allow me to go to stay here and get a good job and be comfortable. He pushed me to going back home. And um, when I went back home, I had nothing because I had lost most of my people. I did not have even an address when I went back. But I had that deep call in God to go, mm. to go and do something. And that's how I left. And when I reached there, my first home, which was paid for by a seminary student here in Duke for, the, for more than five years, a seminary student who went to school with me here was paying my rent. And that home became also a home for very many street children. And really that's how the ministry started. Because somebody invested in, me. in you you were able to invest into others. That's it, yeah. Explain to me, mm. if you would, please, Pastor, mm. what you mean mm. by the deep call of God. The deep call of God, if I were to define it, mm -hmm. it is something that God puts on your heart or puts in, puts in your life that you cannot but do that thing. When I felt the call or when I had the call, I was with absolute certainty mm -hmm. that this was God saying, go and do this. Mm -hmm. That was one. But two, when God calls, he does not first equip you before you go. He sends you in the field. And when you have become obedient, then he gives you the tools when you are there. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I followed that process. I, could no, I did not want to be sidetracked. Growing up, I built a relationship with God whereby I was afraid to do the contrary of what he expected of me. And this is very hard, especially when you have gone through so much education. Yeah. It really, rationalism takes over faith. It also takes over the ability for you to hear the voice of God. Yeah. And so I, w I took a lot of time, so many weeks. I had a mentor here, he's still around, Dr. Rubo. I took a lot of time discussing with him. And um, by the time I made the decision to pack my bags and go, I knew with no shadow of doubt that I was obeying the voice of God. Hmm. And so I went. Now when I went, it was not easy. Here I am with the two master's degrees, going to nothingness, no job, no address, nothing. But I was faithful because uh, I know he is a God who never contradicts himself. Right. When he says something in the appropriate time, he will do it. And I had that deep faith in me. And that's where I went and I became steadfast and we started. Amen. Amen. 
Before you left and you were uh, sitting under the counsel and the advice mm -hmm. and the, the mentorship, discipleship mm -hmm. of Dr. Rubel, mm -hmm. what was the greatest advice that he gave you in, in discerning God's will for your life? You know, when I was here, I was a sickly student. I, the weather wasn't my good friend here. It was very cold. So I frequented the hospitals most of the time. And, um, and really God used that time of my sickness to draw me closer to him because he kept coming and visiting me. Somebody, a president of a college coming to, right. to visit me. And, uh, but whenever he came, he always observed that I had Bible beside me. I was a seminary student, but not all seminary students probably uh, take the Bible as their best uh, the book to read. Um, and then he, I asked him, I said, I want to, you to mentor me. I asked him, I said, I, I admire your uh, spirituality. I admire your deep convictions. I admire your boldness. And I would like to learn from you. And um, a year before I left, we started processing what God really wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I used to go and fill in the pulpit, you know, yeah. these little churches. I would go and, and, and minister. And uh, I was also a hospital chaplain at Anmed. Yeah. You know, so there were all these things coming up. But I remember in March, because I left in June, three months before I left, we started this intense uh, processing and preparation. And one thing he told me, he says, I love you so much. I would love to have you by my side. I would love to see you with great jobs, driving quite expensive cars. Mm. But I would also, more than anything else, you to do the will of God. And I will help you discern the will of God. And I told him, I will sit on your feet and I will learn every step of the way. And um, I, didn't, I wasn't a bad student because God had built in me the skills to listen to him speak to me. Right. And um, the last day I left, I sat on his knee. I, I, I went on my knees. He blessed me. And, uh, and I went to do the will of God. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Pastor Benjamin, I want to ask you this, and, and I want to get into more of, of the ministry in Rwanda mm -hmm. in just a moment. But let's just suppose yeah. that tonight mm -hmm. there's a, a young man or a, a young woman mm -hmm. who's watching this program and uh, they're processing God's will mm -hmm. for their life. Mm -hmm. It may not be Rwanda. It may not even be outside of South Carolina. It may not even be out of Greenville. Mm -hmm. But what advice would you give them for discerning the will of God? Discerning the will of God is a process. It is a process that starts with um, investing time in praying and reading scripture. Um, I, I would invite them to start from there. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, honestly, when you draw close to God in prayer, Right. When you invest time in reading scripture, God will even lead you to the right person. I, the three elements helped me discern the will of God, and I did not miss it. I believe I did not miss it because Amen. most of my time was in reading scripture. The Bible became my best friend. Mm. Every single day, no matter how important you were, I blocked time to pray. Yeah. I still have that culture many, many years ago. And so when I met Dr. Rubo, it was so easy for him because he could discern spiritually that I was in tune with where God was leading me. So the starting point really for me would be how much time of your life do you invest in prayer? Right. How much time of your life do you read scripture? And then when you've reached a certain level, Look for somebody that you believe in, a pastor, an evangelist, or whatever person that you believe um, uh, you can open your heart to because mm -hmm. that really helped me. 
I remember telling him, I said, I, I'm not interested in how much money I can make. Because even if I got a million dollars today, it would not give me the joy and the peace and the rest. It would not take away that from me. Right. So I was very open to him. And he was able to see how best he can help me process all this. What a blessing and, uh, to, just, yeah. to just hear and find out how God used a man to help a man mm -hmm. discern and, and discover he was supposed to reach children. Yes. Would you be will, willing to stay around here for a little bit longer? Sure. I want you to hang with me. And when we come back, I want to talk with the pastor about how RCRI, the Rwandan Children International Ministry, uh, is reaching people today mm -hmm. and the foundation that it was even able to get back then. Thank you. The envoys are coming back around to sing a song entitled, Tell Me the Story. Tell me the story of Jesus. Thank you so much, Envoys, for reminding us that it's all about telling the story. Mm -hmm. Not everybody
tells the story the same way. We all have different makeups, backgrounds, personalities, talents, abilities, and gifts. But the bottom line is this, we really only have one story as Christians, and that is the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're watching this program tonight and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that number on the screen is there for you, my friend, to call. And somebody is uh, more than willing to share the Scripture with you and pray with you and lead you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, isn't it, Pastor? That's true. Just That's very true. As, as, the, as the missionary, as you, mm-hmm. as you so eloquently said a while ago, mm-hmm. as, the, as the white missionary just kissed you on the cheek, and said the love of Christ. I, I'm believing tonight while you're sharing your story that uh, the Holy Spirit is kissing people on the cheek Amen. and Amen. sharing with them the love of Christ. Now, what an interesting story my brother has here. You, uh, at this point in the story, finished Erskine Seminary. Yes. And now... You're going back to Rwanda. God provided through a seminary student, mm-hmm. uh, a, a classmate, yes. to have, have a, a, an apartment furnished for you mm-hmm. and you could minister. How did the ministry of RCRI become birthed out of that apartment? Did it just happen like that or was it, there, there we go again, was it a process much like you going to Rwanda? It actually was a process. RCRI was a process. Even before I came to the U.S. to study, the seed had been really planted. When I finished my undergraduate, I was a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very young. I was maybe 20, and I started teaching. So every morning I would ride my bicycle going to teach. And as I'm going... I see kids coming from underneath the trucks you know, who had spent nights, the kids who had no homes. And, uh, and that is very typical in many third world countries. And um, of course, quickly, the Lord sparked something in you and he says, you would have been one of those. You could be coming from those trucks. Right. You are no better than them. You are not more holy than them. It's just by the grace of God wow. that you can ride a bicycle. You spent a night on a bed, and they spent a night in the cold. You know? hmm. And so it, it, it's something that kept really running in my mind, even when I did whatever I did. You know? And um, I remember I would sometimes stop and uh, hey, ask them what's happening. Do, you, do I have like 50 cents? Hey, give whatever I have. Right. And uh, so fast forward, I go to school, I mean, come to the U.S., do all these educations. I mean, they, that never died in me. Right. I knew that uh, uh, although I didn't build the mansions, the few minutes that I would stop, they knew that somebody actually cared. Mm. Somebody knew that we are God's creations. And... Uh, So when I went back, I really wanted, actually I needed to follow up on the children that I had built relationships with. Right. Most of them I couldn't trace. A few of them I would bump into them here and there. And so it was easier for me. The heart was already there. The seed had been planted a long time. But when I came back from seminary, I called these kids from the streets. I had a partner and we, uh, we would bring kids and mm-hmm. they would stay with us. So our home became their home. Mm-hmm. And during this time, we are teaching them the love of Christ. We are teaching them how to help each other. And um, that's how it really started. From a home. Small. Small. Small start. Small. Great impact. Small start. Yeah. And then we grew. More kept coming. Kids kept coming from the streets. 
Uh, we had already started identifying child-headed households, kids who have no mother or father, and they're actually taking care of themselves. Right. Uh, we had met so many children who you'd meet on the street that they don't know their names. You ask them, what's your name? They say, I'm boy, I'm a girl. Girl is not a name, boy is not a name, but all they know is a street. They do not have an address. And so it was clear that God wanted us to get closer to them. And so we started gathering them. We'd gather them Saturdays, Sunday, minister. To, they became our starting church. We'd yeah. minister to them. Yeah. You know? And at the time, we didn't have anything. All we did was tell them that Jesus loves you. Now, what is your wife's name? My wife's name is Josephine. How does Josephine feel about her husband now bringing in these children off the street? At the time, I wasn't married. At that time, I wasn't married. But even when we got married, actually, she found... I think she loved me when she found me painting a, a place where the, I was staying with the kids. You know? that, that got her. That, I think that's got I, her. I, th I think that, that, that did the trick, <laughs> Pastor, when she saw, she saw, if any man will work like that, I, I, I want him for a husband. I, I believe so, because she kept, actually when she came, she was surprised to see the kids that she used to send away on the street. Yeah. Those who would come to beg from her. I had them, I was staying with them. And she said, how is this possible? How, <laughs> how do you stay with kids that are, be are beggars, are thieves? Because that's the label of a street child. Right. They, they, they are, that's the way they survive. That's you know? how they survive. If you are not careful, you cook and leave a pot outside there of food, they will lift and take it because it is survival for the fittest. Yeah. And yet I brought them in. So that caught her. And so it started from that small, us mentoring them, praying with them. But the need kept growing. We kept meeting these kids, embrace. And today, we have more than 500 children. And each one of them has a unique story. Each one of them has a story where at the end of the day, you see God's redemptive hand. Yeah. I like to call them stories of hope. Sure. Know, stories of redemption. Because when any one of them sits and tells you, how, we have kids who at the age of eight, they had spent three to four years in jail. Because when they are cleaning the streets, sometimes they throw them in jail so that the, the city looks a little bit clean. And uh, they are now back in school. They are in boarding schools. They are leaders in their school. They can memorize scripture. What a joy for me to find myself. And, and what a joy it is for us to, to hear yeah. how God's using you. Yeah. I want to ask you this. Are, are there any efforts being made mm -hmm. presently mm -hmm. to reduce or eradicate the problem of, of street children in Rwanda? When, when you talk about mm -hmm. walking up to a little boy mm -hmm. and saying, what is your name? And he says, boy. Mm -hmm. Or little girl, I'm girl. What what's being done? Well, a lot of initiatives are being done, and um, I'm grateful to my government. They actually don't give us resources to do what we do, but they encourage us to do what we do, mm -hmm. and that is a big plus. They right now there are many people like me, myself yeah. who have felt the call to embrace these vulnerable children. There are different ministries that are struggling, but you can see that they have the heart. The Rwandese homes are slowly beginning to open their homes to embrace children that have no address. And by doing that, hopefully the numbers will get smaller and mm. smaller and smaller on the streets. But like our initiative, for instance, what we do with these kids is we send them into schools. We mentor them, we minister them, but also try to send them into schools. Right. That is a little bit problematic because we send them in different schools. So God impressed it on our hearts to have our own Christian school. And we have started Nyabihu Christian Academy. 
And what we want to do when we complete its construction, we will bring all these kids there. Yeah. Can you imagine the impact when kids feed on the word of God morning and evening? Yeah. When kids fellowship together, when kids learn how to help each other, when kids learn how to love each other. These are former kids who had no concept of love. Right. These are kids who had no home. Their home is the street. Now they are together. Praise they God. They form a unity. So we believe that our initiatives, when duplicated across the four corners of the country, right. then we will not only eradicate the problem of street children, or the problem of vulnerable and marginalized children, but we will build a quality citizenry. Yeah. People who, when they have finished their high school or college education, they can have an impact for, of God wherever they are. That is our vision for the place. And so, yes, initiatives are there, still very few, still very limited, but we are seeking God's guidance. Mm -hmm. And we know that God will bring along people who will catch into that vision and will want to journey with us. Right, Yeah. right. Much of our, our viewing audience, of yeah. course, is familiar with the uh, 1994 genocide mm. against uh, the people of Rwanda. Mm. But what I'm, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing you say mm. this evening is that uh, you're taken a step by faith, many steps by faith, to, to confront the spiritual mm. genocide. Exactly. There's a spiritual genocide as mm. well that, mm. that sometimes we forget about. E mm. Even in our country, mm. we look at a, at a physical or a, or a military problem and, mm. and we leave it there, but there's a spiritual warfare as well, isn't yes. there? Yes, yes. Um, it is, but, but a genocide really, um, the first step of a genocide is spiritual. Yeah. Because it is, it is an extermination yeah. of, 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 of a people. Right. And the best extermination of a people that has taken place is by the work of the devil. The devil is the best genocider that yeah. has ever been. When you read and watch what happened in Rwanda, yeah. how can somebody come and tell you get a machete, not a gun, a machete, and descend on your brother and sister and cut off his head? Only the devil can do that. No doubt. Only the devil can do that. And so, yes, um, I'm afraid that we, we, we worry so much about the physical genocide, the military genocide, yeah. the tribal genocide, and we forget about the spiritual genocide. I've got to ask you this question, Pastor. Now, bef before we're done this evening, I want to uh, let our folks at home know how that uh, they can invest mm. and involve themselves into the ministry mm. of RCRI. But I've, but I've just got to ask you this question. And, uh, and I, want you to be, I want you to be very, very transparent with me. Yeah. I want you to be honest. You've lived there in Rwanda, and then you came to school here. Mm. And God sent you back to Rwanda, having lived in both places. Mm. What, what word of exhortation would you give the American church? Whew. That is quite uh, a good question, you know. Um, I think the few churches I've preached in, I never miss it. I always tell them. Um, when I got here, I was overwhelmed by the wealth that is here. Right. I was overwhelmed by the comfort. The, I mean, it was easier for me to trust God at a certain point of my life, because I had nothing else. Mm -hmm. It is only God that I had before me, behind, and every direction of my life, all I had was God. Mm -hmm. 
the few students and the people I have talked and worked with here, trusting God was optional. Yeah, yeah. And, and I said, okay, we can talk about trusting God. And I, and I said, well, is it because you have it all? Is it because you do not, why? What is the reason? I, I battled with that. I battled with the ungratefulness that mm -hmm. I saw people complain that, um, uh, that the price of gas has gone up by 50 cents. It has come down by, um, I battled with that. Um, the only word I would tell the church in America is, uh, would you learn how to say more thank yous to God yeah. than anything else? Good word. Uh, really, to me, that was the challenge I battled with. And if I had the opportunity to tell the entire nation, that is one thing I would tell them. Well, I'm not saying that, that we, have, <laughs> we have reached the entire nation tonight, yeah. but, but you've, you've definitely reached yeah. a part yeah. of our world yeah. as we know it. Mm -hmm. Would it be safe to say that mm -hmm. when we totally surrender to God, it'll be impossible for us to keep from loving Him and loving each other. Well, all you have to say is, yeah, it'd be possible <laughs> because we're going to go to a song by the envoys and they're going to sing mm -hmm. loving God okay. and loving each other. Will you stay around here a little bit longer? I, will. I want to talk to you when we come back. You I be will. blessed as Thank the envoys you. sing. with my friend. 
the studio and you at home sing with us. Loving God, loving each other, making music with my friends. said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, by your love, one for another. May it be so. Welcome back to Nightline. Thank you for that song from the Odd Boys, Loving God and Loving Each Other. Uh, I've believed for a long, long time that there's a kindred spirit among God's children, among Christ's followers. The Spirit of God bears witness one with another that we are the children of God. Mm -hmm. And Pastor, I don't have any other reason than but to tell you this because it's my heart. When I met you coming into the studio this evening, I just immediately sensed the kindred spirit of the Holy Spirit. And I just Amen. praise the Lord Amen. for the way He has used you to speak Amen. to my own heart Amen. this evening, as well as I'm sure many, many other hearts and lives. And uh, thank you for what you've shared and thank you for what you've said. For RCRI to run its activities on a daily basis. What are some of the greatest challenges that you face? Wow. By the way, RCRI um, right now ministers to over 500 children. And we directly deal with over 150 women, most of them widows, all of them actually widows. Mm -hmm. uh, those that have their husbands, we don't actually consider them. Um, so the greatest challenge that we have is resources. We run on a monthly basis on a budget of less than $1,000, running a ministry that big. For over 500 children. For over 500 children. And this includes interventions. For instance, kids die mm -hmm. from simple communicable diseases. They die. And I don't have staff. Everybody who works is a volunteer because I can't afford to pay the staff. Um, we have all these cases of that where we need interventions, you know. Um, right. th these kids, all they have is us and God, of course, but God uses us to be there for them. We have a sponsorship program which can enable us to send these children to school. More than 50% of these children have no sponsors. So we have over 300 kids who go to school and all that becomes debt that I incur. Right. Or I have to negotiate and they give a discount. And so the debt accumulates. But we are believing God that God will raise partners, people who will say, God, you have blessed me. I can give $200 and send a child to school. Right. For a year, I can give $300 and send a child in secondary school. For a year. We are believing that God can raise 300 people this year who can say, Benjamin, can you send me a form, a profile of a child, and I support that child. 
So those are some of the challenges. Uh, the other challenge is, as I told you earlier, we want to build a Christian school. We have actually started building it. Mm -hmm. By the way, none of what we have done was on budget. We only believed God. And God would send somebody, he says, I'm giving you 5,000 for property and would buy a plot. The other one would say, I'm giving you 2,000, lay the foundation. And just out of faith, we have two buildings and now are completing a dining hall where we will start feeding our children. So we are believing God for partners, people who will come and say, God, you have blessed me so much. I want to write a check so that you can put a building there where the kids will study and stay. We have special projects, projects like uh, a goat's project, whereby if you give a child a goat, you can raise it. We have so much going on that we are praying that God will send people who will feel plugged into this ministry right. and come along and uh, help us uh, uh, fulfill the mandate that God has placed on us. We are looking forward to receiving missionaries, people who will say, oh, God is calling me into the mission field, and not a tourist. We don't want tourists there. We mm -hmm. want people who will come to work. No vacationers. No vacationers. Actually, I don't take, I don't know what a vacation looks like. Mm -hmm. So when you come to me, you say, Brother Ben, I want to work with you. I will send you in the field. I will take, if you cannot teach, if you cannot minister, you will, I will say, go and just love on these kids. These kids need somebody to love on them. You can do that. So we are wide open. The challenges are big. But we know that the God we serve is bigger Amen. than any challenge Amen. that we encounter. And so we are calling on anybody that wants to be part of God's work in Rwanda. Amen. Amen. If there's a, a pastor or a, a church, a, a missionary, just, or, or even a businessman yes. who says, uh, maybe I can't go. Mm -hmm. But I, I would love to help. Is this the, the information here? Yes. This is our website. Uh, but we are a 501c3. You're saying that right. And um, so whatever you give, whatever you donate to the ministry, uh, you will get whatever you do here. I think you get like receipts. And I'm not sure what you do with those receipts. But uh, I think people do that. Um, so you will get that. But... Um, Besides supporting us, yeah. I encourage people to pray for us. Yeah, amen. And I assure you that uh, we're going to do that. Yes. And as, as Pastor Benjamin said, you, you will get a receipt from their ministry if you do contribute. Mm -hmm. But more than getting a receipt, mm -hmm. you'll get a blessing. Mm -hmm. And you'll get the assurance of knowing that you're laying up for yourself treasures in heaven yes. where thieves can't break through and steal. Amen. Can I just say thanks Thank you. so much You're for coming welcome. by Thank this you. evening. Thank I praise the Lord for you. To, to May I have just a, a brief prayer for you and Thank for the you. children of Rwanda. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, for meeting uh, Pastor Benjamin this evening. I thank you, Lord, for what he said and for what he shared. But moreover, I thank you, Lord, for what you have said through him and for what you have shared with us through him. I pray not only for him and the children of Rwanda and the widows of Rwanda, but I pray for the children of Greenville and for the widows here in our own area. May we not just simply talk the talk, but Blessed Father, may we also walk the walk. Father, I pray that you might continue to protect those in military service, those who are serving our country on foreign soil. I pray, Lord, for our president, for all that are in authority on every level, that you might give them the wisdom they need to seek the face of a God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Father, for hearing and for answering our prayer. 
For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, amen. thank you so much for being a part of Nightline. Thank you, and God bless you. And God bless you, sir. And thank you, you for giving us the opportunity to share with you the good, good news of Jesus and His love for you. God bless you, and have a great rest of this evening.